I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is uh, Father Ted Deziak. I'm the university chaplain at Loyola University of New Orleans. Uh, we are very, very happy to see um, you gathered here today to hear our speaker, but also to be here to kick off our Lenten series. We actually uh, kicked it off on Monday. We tried, uh, for the first time, we tried a Lenten breakfast. And we invited members of the Loyola community. And it really turned out well. In fact, we had over 120 uh, people participating. So hopefully, we can do it again. In fact, I think we're, uh, we have to find a bigger space, because uh, I think we filled the largest room, St. Charles room, on campus. But keep that in mind, for those who wish. And I know there were a few people here that uh, came and actually uh, started the week off really well. Uh, tonight, we have Father Fred Kammer speaking, and he will be introduced by a member of the uh, Loyola University Alumni Association uh, Spirituality Committee. But I'd also like to just mention that we do have um, five different events occurring during Lent on every Wednesday and uh, during these uh, five Wednesdays of Lent. Next week, and I'm going to uh, mention it again at the end, just in case anyone uh, uh, leaves early. We have uh, Father Jeremy Zippel. Now, Father Zippel is really an interesting man because he has done a lot of work in audiovisual, in media, and he is currently, he actually taught here at the university for a semester uh, in the School of Music and Fine Arts, and now he's working as the director of America Magazine or America Magazine Media. And so he'll be here speaking next week. His topic is actually going to be Living Mercy, the Path of Pope Francis. Actually, and it won't be here because he's a media man and he would like to be surrounded by all kinds of screens. So he, it's going to be in the Nunemaker Auditorium in Monroe Hall. So if you come next week, uh, there'll be signs around here, but it's in Nunemaker Auditorium. So again, we welcome you all. We hope to see you again. We encourage you to kind of come and really use this as moments of spirituality, uh, moments where you can really learn a little bit about the year of mercy and spirituality of Pope Francis. So we thank you for coming. Welcome. My name is Danielle Darys, class of 1990. On behalf of the Ignatian Spirituality Committee, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. Father Fed Fred Kamer is a priest, an attorney, and director of the Jesuit Social Research Institute. He has been the provincial superior of the province. He has been the president, CEO of Catholic Charities, worked as the policy advisor for health and welfare issues, Department of Social Development, and World Peace. Prior to that, he was the executive director of Catholic Community Services in Baton Rouge. He's a New Orleans native, receiving his JD from Yale University, and he holds many honorary doctorates. So without further ado, our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, and uh, I'd like to thank Father Deziak and the uh, planning committee. I'm happy to be here and happy to kick off this series. I'm gonna kick it off with, uh, with really the first long piece of Pope Francis's work. He, he put out an early encyclical, but it was really drafted by Pope Benedict and he added to it, et cetera. But this was his first original piece of his own called The Joy of the Gospel. I wanna thank all of you for coming from your busy lives to be here. Um, and I promise not to tell any, any Cajun jokes, so that will make the evening shorter. <laughs> In 1987, the great Jewish rabbi and philosopher Abraham jo Joshua Heschel wrote the following. He said, it is customary to blame secular science and anti-religious philosophy for the eclipse of religion in modern society. It would be more honest to blame religion for its own defeats. Religion declined not because it was refuted, but because it became irrelevant, dull, oppressive, insipid. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, 
When the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. A very strong sentence. When faith is completely replaced by creed, worship by discipline, love by habit, when the crisis of today is ignored because of the splendor of the past, when faith becomes an heirloom rather than a living fountain, when religion speaks only in the name of authority rather than with the voice of compassion, its message becomes meaningless. Now, while not setting out to respond to Rabbi Heschel's observations, in The Joy of the Gospel, which was dated November 24th in 2013, Pope Francis is blazing a contrary path, a path for Catholic Christians that, in my opinion, is exciting, attractive, faith-driven, worshipful, loving, and compassionate. In his opening paragraph, Pope Francis writes this, The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and the lives of all who encountered Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. In this exhortation, I wish to encourage the Christian faithful to embark upon a new chapter of evangelization marked with this joy while pointing out new paths for the church's journey in the years to come. Later, in paragraph 17, it was all the way down to paragraph 17, we found out what the Pope was going to talk about. <laughs> he tells us that among other things, he has decided to discuss at length these seven questions. The reform of the church in her missionary outreach, the temptations faced by pastoral workers, the church understood as the entire people of God which evangelizes, the homily and its preparation, the inclusion of the poor in society, peace and dialogue within society, and the spiritual motivations for mission. Seven topics. Well, I'm hoping that other speakers in this series will get to some of these topics, uh, which continue actually to, to, to color the work of Pope Francis. But this evening, I want to underscore four messages that are in this apostolic exhortation to help kick off this series. The four are these. The joy of salvation, the messianic people of God, the challenge of the golden calf, and the transformative effects of evangelization. So the joy of salvation, the messianic people of God, the challenge of the golden calf, and the transformative effects of evangelization. First, the joy of salvation. As, as Francis emphasized in his opening paragraph, the gospel literally is, and that's what the word means, good news. Good news that we are set free by the love of God embodied in Christ Jesus from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. God has reached across the human divine divide and across and throughout all of human history and offered to each of us and to all of us unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness. No matter what we've done or failed to do, no matter where we live, what we have, or who we are. In Francis' words, with Christ, joy is constantly born anew. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. And the Pope reminds us of the many wonderful messages of joy in the scriptures all through this first part. And the assurances of Jesus, for example, that I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. And a little bit later in John's Gospel, no one will take your joy from you. Then in a wonderful turn of phrase, the Pope asks us 
this question. Why should we not also enter into this great stream of joy? Why should we not also enter into this great stream of joy? He asked a number of questions in this apostolic exhortation, and I will quote about five of them in this talk tonight. But why should we not also enter into this great stream of joy? Because we encounter God's love in this great stream of joy, we are, in Francis' words, liberated from our narrowness and self-absorption. And God brings us, quote, beyond ourselves in order to attain the fullest truth of our being. Francis continues on and he explains the impulse for evangelization with another question. For if we have received the love which restores meaning to our lives, how can we fail to share this love with others? How can we fail to share this love with others? It's like a person winning the lottery or having a baby or graduating from college, or passing the bar exam, and telling no one about it. It's not just a question also of telling another of the love of God as if we read it in the newspaper, but Pope Francis emphasizes that one who has been liberated by God's love, quote, becomes more sensitive to the needs of others. And he reminds us, as St. Paul wrote, the love of God urges us on. The love of God urges us on. Second, the messianic people of God. The conce conception of us as church that so influences the writing and the preaching of Pope Francis is the Vatican II concept of the church as the messianic people of God, but with a twist. His personal understanding of this is influenced strongly by the approach of the Argentine theology of the people. Something from Argentina, his home country. The Argentine theology of the people. His personal theological spokesman, who's Cardinal Walter Casper, a German cardinal, wrote this to explain the Argentine theology of the people. He says, Pope Francis' style is correctly understood against the background of the theology of the people. This style is not good-natured folksiness or even cheap populism. Behind the Pope's pastoral style, which is close to the people, stands an entire theology, a mysticism of the people. For him, the church is far more than an organic and hierarchical institution. It is above all the people of God on their way to God. A pilgrim and evangelizing people that transcends every however necessary institutional expression. This might help explain to us why he asked for the people's blessing the night of his election before he blessed them. But Casper, Cardinal Casper goes on to, in his explanation of the Church of Pope Francis to write this. Ultimately, the Church is rooted in the secret of the Most Holy Trinity. Salvation is a work of God's mercy. So here we are in the year of mercy. God's mercy. Out of sheer grace, God draws us to himself through his spirit and brings us together as his people. Thus, the Church stands under the primacy of grace. The Lord always precedes us, precedes us with his love and his initiative. Through his spirit, he draws us to himself, not as isolated individuals, but as his people. So the church must be a place of re renegotiated mercy. A great phrase, a church of renegotiated mercy, where all can feel themselves welcomed and loved, where they experience pardon and can feel encouraged to live according to the good life of the gospel. This theology of the people was framed strongly and first for the first time by the Latin American bishops at a conference in a place called Aparecida in Brazil in 2007. And Cardinal Bergoglio, the future Pope Francis, ended up being the document's principal author. So to really understand his theology, one can go back to the Aparecida document. 
And the Aparathita document embraces what was called the holy, faithful people of God. The holy, faithful people of God. As subjects of history and of culture, and as both recipients and agents of evangelization. It emphasizes people building, in which God is calling forth his people into a new birth of justice, protected and encouraged by a church that looks firstly to the poor and to the margins. In contrast to a European church seen to be in decline in the face of secularism, and a U.S. church seemingly mired in child sex abuse and culture wars, one biographer argues that it is the dynamic aparecida vision of the church that was part of the choice of Cardinal Bergoglio to be Pope. This commentator writes of Aparecida and Francis. In its vision and vigor, its fierce advocacy of the poor and its missionary spirituality, its bold proclamation of the birth of a new springtime of faith, Aparecida was now the program, the key to a whole new effort of evangelization in Latin America linked inextricably to the liberation of a people. Nowhere else in the world was there anything to compare with it. It was the expression of a new maturity, of a local church come of age. He goes on to write, two years ago, so he wrote this a year ago, in the Sistine Chapel, the Cardinals chose not just the man, but the program. Whether or not they were aware of it, in electing Francis, they were allowing the fire lit at a Parasita to be brought to Rome, to shake up the Vatican, and to light the universal church. Our eyes are still adjusting. <laughs> in the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis brings into play from the vision of a Parasita the emphasis upon popular piety, culture, and reaching out to the margins of society. He calls upon us to go outside our institutional church worries in these words. Each Christian and every community must discern the path that the Lord points out. But all of us are asked to obey his call to go forth from our own comfort zone in order to reach all the peripheries in need of the light of the gospel. We have to go forth and preach the gospel, Francis writes, because, quote, the joy of the gospel is for all people. No one can be excluded. But later he asks us another question. But to whom should she go first? But to whom should she go first? And he answers his own question. When we read the gospel, we find a clear indication not so much our friends and wealthy neighbors, but above all the poor and the sick, those who are usually despised and overlooked, those who cannot repay you, citing Luke 14. There can be no room for doubt or for explanations which weaken so clear a message, he writes. Today in all ways, the poor are the privileged recipients of the gospel, and the fact that it is freely preached to them is a sign of the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. We have to state without mincing words that there is an inseparable bond between our faith and the poor. May we never abandon them. In that light, Francis never tires of reminding us that evangelizers should take on a phrase we've most of us have heard, the smell of the sheep. And that he prefers, these great phrases are all in this apostolic exhortation also, a church which is bruised, hurting and dirty because it has been out in the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and clinging to its own security. So the messianic people of God must be out and about the world, driven by the dynamic of the gospel news itself to preach the gospel to all the world, as St. Paul says, in season and out. Third, the challenge of the golden calf. It's very striking that after paragraph one, where Francis talks about evangelization of joy, he writes this. This is the next paragraph. 
The great danger in today's world, pervaded as it is by consumerism, is the desolation and anguish born of a complacent yet covetous heart, the, f the feverish pursuit of frivolous pleasures and a blunted conscience. Whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard, the quiet joy of his love is no longer felt, and the desire to do good fades. In the very next sentences, Francis warns us that this is not just a concern for those people out there who didn't come to this talk tonight. <laughs> But for all of us as Christians, he says, this is a very real danger for believers, too. Many fall prey to it and end up resentful, angry, and listless. There's no way, that, that is no way to live a dignified and fulfilled life. It is not God's will for us, nor is it the life in the Spirit which has its source in the heart of the risen Christ. When I was reading this, I was reminded of a Famous saying of Mother Teresa of Calcutta, which you may not have heard, it's just three words. She said, muchness is suffocating. Muchness is suffocating. And as his exhortation proceeds, Francis lays out a thoroughgoing critique, not just of the influence of consumerism and individualism on us as persons, individually, but a devastating impact of the ways in which our desires for things, for stuff, for more, for mammon, for the golden calf, is embodied on a grand scale in what Francis calls an economy of exclusion and inequality. Pope Francis warns us, these are his words, such an economy kills. Such an economy kills. And then he asks us another of his penetrating questions. How can it be that it is not a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure, but it is news when the stock market loses two points? Later Pope Francis further explains how structural causes affect the poor and create poverty and how those structural causes must be addressed by us as Christians. He writes this, a short paragraph. The need to resolve the structural causes of poverty cannot be delayed, not only for the pragmatic reason of its urgency for the good order of society, but because society needs to be cured of a sickness which is weakening and frustrating it and which can only lead to new crises. Welfare projects which meet certain urgent needs should be considered merely temporary responses. As long as the problems of the poor are not radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and financial speculation, and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found for the world's problems, or for that matter, to any problems. Inequality is the root of social ills. In a way, what Francis is doing is he's explaining to us that just as consumerism and the desire for more and more affect our personal moral compass, so the widespread concentration of more and more in the pockets of just a few of us affects the moral climate of nations and the moral climate of the world. Is what Francis calls money's, and this is a quote, dominion over ourselves and our societies. <coughs> He puts it this way. He says, we have created new idols. The worship of the ancient golden calf has returned in a new and ruthless guise in the idolatry of money and the dictatorship of an impersonal economy lacking a truly human purpose. This in turn feeds what Francis first called, and you may remember this from a, from a mass he celebrated on the coast of, uh, of Italy. Um, he first used the phrase, the globalization of indifference. He was celebrating mass on the coast, on the shores of Italy where thousands of immigrants had drowned in the Mediterranean, trying to find a new life for themselves and their families. And he uses that same phrase again in this letter, the globalization of indifference in the joy of the gospel. And against it 
and the privatization of the gospel, he calls us to another good phrase, the revolution of tenderness inaugurated by Jesus Christ. The revolution of tenderness inaugurated by Jesus Christ. Fourth, the transformative effects of evangelization. With his call to the joy of evangelization, the joy of evangelization, and joy-filled evangelization, kind of two things, Pope Francis is laying out a road map to a multiple transformation, a four-part transformation, a transformation of the church, a transformation of our parishes, a transformation of our marriages and families, and a transformation of civil society. All four of these run through the letter. First, joyful evangelization will transform our church. Joyful evangelization will transform our church. Francis writes this, the church which goes forth is a community of missionary disciples who take the first step, who are involved and supportive, who bear fruit and rejoice. An evangelizing community knows that the Lord has taken the initiative. The Lord has loved us first, and therefore we can move forward. We can boldly take the initiative, go out to others, seek those who've fallen away, stand at the crossroads, and welcome the outcast. The missionary church, Francis continues, will be marked by mercy, so we have our year of mercy, and service. He writes this, such a community has an endless desire to show mercy the fruit of its own experience of the power of the Father's infinite mercy. Again, it's why we get our greeting now at the end of Mass. Go forth and be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. So let us try a little harder, he says, to take the first step and become involved. Then he uses an example. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. The Lord gets involved and he involves his own, and as he kneels to wash their feet, he tells his disciples, you will be blessed if you do this. An evangelizing community gets involved by word and deed in people's daily lives. It bridges distances. It's willing to abase itself if necessary, and it embraces human life, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. Another great phrase, touching the suffering flesh of Christ in others. It's no surprise then that Francis soon after writing this letter declared that this year would be the year of mercy. He's telling us that to be joyful evangelizers, we as church must be transformed by the very message that we're preaching to the world. It has to tr transform the church. We're called to renewal, he writes, a constant self-renewal born of fidelity to Jesus Christ. And then like Martin Luther King, Francis tells us in the letter, he has a dream. He said, I dream of a missionary option. That is a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, its ways of doing things, its times and schedules, its language and structures can be suitably challenged for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her self-preservation. It's not about the self-preservation of the church, she's saying. It's about the evangelization of the world. And then not in this letter, but in a retreat that he gave to Caritas workers, Catholic Charities workers, he said, Instead of being a missionary church, we have Jesus tied up in the sacristy. We have Jesus tied up in the sacristy. So the church has to be transformed. But secondly, he says, the evangelizing parish will also be transformed. He writes this, the parish is not an outdated institution. Precisely because it possesses great flexibility, it can assume quite different contours depending on the openness and the missionary creativity of the pastor and the community. How might such an evangelizing parish look? Francis continues, in its activities, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. It's a community of communities. It's a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey and a center of constant missionary outreach. Sadly, the Pope observed, 
The call to renew our parishes has not yet transformed them into what he calls environments of living, communion, and participation, which also will be completely mission-oriented. So the parish will be transformed by being a missionary parish. And then Francis observes that the family and all communities and social bonds are experiencing a profound cultural crisis in today's world. In part, he blames the individualism of our postmodern and globalized world. And in face of this individualism, Francis calls for pastoral outreach and evangelization that emphasizes our relationship with God the Father. He's saying we need to emphasize the relationship that we all have with God the Father and how that relationship, this is a quote, demands and encourages a communion which heals, promotes, and reinforces interpersonal bonds. In other words, to the degree that we can emphasize the fact that we are all, as Jesus said, children of one Father, we can begin to heal the broken bonds among ourselves, in our families, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, etc. So that's the third transformation. And lastly, our evangelization, Francis said, must transform the world. He puts it this way. An authentic faith, which is never comfortable or completely personal, always involves a deep desire to change the world, to transmit values, to leave this earth somehow better than we found it. It's interesting, then he introduces the environment question here, long before he wrote Loud Out to See, his new encyclical on the environment. But you can hear it in here just in a couple of sentences. He said, we love this magnificent planet on which God has put us. And we love the human family which dwells here. With all its tragedies and struggles, its hopes and aspirations, its strengths and weaknesses. The earth is our common home and all of us are brothers and sisters. If indeed the just ordering of society and of the state is a central responsibility of, of politics, the church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. All Christians, their pastors included, are called to show concern for the building of a better world. This is a long, long document. So there's much, much more in it. And Francis in this document has a lot to say about building a better world. But his key insight in this letter really is that true evangelization involves and calls us to a dynamic and persistent commitment to this endeavor of creating a better world. That as far back as the Senate of Bishops in 1971, they said action for justice is a constitutive element of the preaching of the gospel. That we cannot preach the gospel in the world today without work, working to make this a better world. Desiring for all of our sisters and brothers a life of human dignity and justice and equality. In summary then, this has been a very quick overview. Francis reminds us that our gospel is an should be an incredible source of joy that should transform the church, it should transform our parishes, it should transform our marriages and our families, and it should transform our world. This ultimately is true because at the core of our faith, where he starts, really, in the first paragraph, at the heart of the gospel and in the hearts of true evangelizers, what shines forth, this is a quote, what shines forth is the beauty of the saving love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ who died and rose from the dead. That is the joy of the gospel. Thank you. I think we have time for questions or comments, right, Ted? Good. I know I kind of mowed you down here. <laughs> yeah, Marcel. Do you have any process for getting that, put it on some uh, web page? Back of my business card? <laughs> <laughs> we may. I think Ted. You may post this. Actually, you're going to turn this into a video. It's going to be posted on YouTube. Oh, yeah. It will be posted on our, our web page, but it will be connected in some way to uh, So will you be able to watch it again? And uh, if anyone wants to transcribe it again? Well, actually, I probably can send you the text, Ted, in addition. 
Yes. Every writing I've read from Pope um, Francis, the term, the word mercy sticks out. Yeah. The speeches, the term mercy sticks out, which I assume has got to be synonymous with forgiveness. And it's my appreciation that forgiveness is repetitive. And the same person can ask for forgiveness tens of thousands of times, and that equates to mercy. Yeah. Ironically, today I spent an hour going through Francis's writings looking for the word mercy. It, the task is easy. If any of you want to do it, you go to the Bishop's Conference website, which is uh, usccb.org. Go to the Department of Social Development and World Peace, and they're actually are keeping, it's about 90 pages long now, they're keeping quotations from Francis by topic. So you can say family, you can go to family, and there'll be 20 quotes from Francis about family, and they're all uh, coded to at the back of the glossary, or uh, the date that he said it and who he said it to, and if he said two things on the same day, they're distinguished, etc. But I went looking at mercy. There was about 40 quotations about mercy, one of which is forgiveness. That's very clear. But other words that come up in his narrative are words like compassion, the story of the Good Samaritan, um, justice comes up in there. All of these words come up, but yes, it starts with the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, and that's what he starts this letter with that we've all benefited from the love and forgiveness of God in our lives and in our faith lives. Um, beginning and epitomized in its highest act in the crucifixion of Jesus. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, mercy seems, st you start with forgiveness, but Francis embellishes it and it comes up in different contexts and sentences, etc. If you go look at all these quotes from him on mercy. Yes? Yeah, he, he uses that image, the golden calf, and he uses it, as I say, in both the individual for each of us in terms of our own consumerism, etc., but also in terms of society's admiration of wealth and those who hold it and the concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. So he does use it in the, in the document. I was actually surprised to see it when I first read the document. Yeah. And in the back? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of it would be in, in terms of, uh, if you look back at sort of his writings about living a gospel life, would be in terms of simplifying our own lives, of course, but also in terms of addressing the justice questions and inequality questions in society at large. And he writes a lot about that. He writes about the economy, uh, etc. So there's a lot of his, in his writings, if you go back and look at the whole letter. As I say, the, the apostolic exhortation is very long. Yes? This, you said he embodies, what did you call it, Argentinian? It's Argentine theology of the people. Okay, how does that compare to uh, li liberation theology? So some of the distinctions are, among other things, a lot of liberation theology was kind of by theologians, et cetera, down. There's a heavy, heavy emphasis in his personal spirituality and in the theology of the people of the devotions, the popular devotions of people. Uh, and so there's a distinction that Argentines would have brought to the debate about liberation theology that in some ways popular devotion was, was some people saw it as being looked down upon. He's very high on the importance of kind of faith from the bottom up. And I think that again would go back to that little gesture about asking people to bless him first. And he's giving out rosaries when he goes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, so he's, he's, uh, it has that strong thing in it, that, that whole thing about the popular devotion, and also the importance of respecting cultures. Indigenous, like you saw him in Mexico recently, going out to, among indigenous people, apologizing for the way the church, in a sense, stamped out a lot of indigenous cultures and religions. So he's, he's very strong on the, on, the, on the theology of the people. Yeah, Fleet. I think that it's indicative also that you have people in governments all over the world quoting him or talking about what he had brought up. And we've never had this 
in our lifetime with a pope. His language is extraordinary, but it's not what we're accustomed to reading in encyclicals. It's very frank. It's very it concrete. It yeah. Yes. yeah. It's pithy, and it's beautiful yeah. to me. Marcel? What do you think is the influence of his Jesuit background? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a chance to... Uh, well, other people, other people are writing about that. There are people writing more scholarly articles about that than I am. I mean, I think a piece of it is the, uh, is the very concrete uh, experience of Jesus Christ. You know, when you make, make the spiritual exercise of Ignatius, you, you spend a significant amount of time walking with Jesus. And I think there's that concreteness about him talking about Jesus, talking about the people, talking about mercy. The, the God has said that there's that, that piece of it, I think, is clearly there. Um, in terms of, but others are writing those articles. <laughs> this seems like such a naive question, and I'm almost embarrassed to ask it, but I, I hear so much about, there is so much inequality, and I, you hear in political circles, you hear it all over the world, but we'll never reach an inequality equal state. And, I mean, I, it's one thing when the politicians are saying it, but when you hear the Pope saying it, I, I don't know that, I, I understand we need to work at trying to make people to raise up people's status, to do everything we can to make them feel worthwhile, that they are true, you know, children of God, to give them everything we can. But, but there's no, they'll never be true. Well, the point, yeah, the point's not to make everybody it's the same. But the dilemma that he's talking about and that others talk about is the gap between the very wealthy and ordinary people is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the concentration of wealth in the world is in the hands of a couple of hundred people. And also the need to basically redistribute, to use a word from Catholic social teaching. Other questions? <laughs> well, I have to say, actually, I've not been watching the political debates. I'm sort of waiting till it matters more to me, in the sense of in the sense of when my vote gets closer. Um, others? Yes. I find it really interesting that Francis is so incredibly popular within the church and um, especially at this time in our, in, our, in our world, in our society, because his message is so radical, right? Like this, the joy of the gospel in reading it, I was profoundly moved by it and it excited me and it made me feel confident and comfortable in naming myself and claiming the identity as a Catholic woman. I was like, this is what it's all about. And he's, and he's writing it, and he's doing it, and he's living it. And yet, the Catholics that I know, and Catholics that I love, love him, who, who do not identify with that world at all, or with what he's claiming, and with what he's living, and preaching, and writing about. And yet, he's shaking this church, and the conscience, and the heart of the church in a way that I don't think, um, oh, I just find really surprising and, um, and uh, exciting and um, invigorating. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I think that. Thanks, Tess. Yeah, the uh, church has always been saying, whenever we talk about kind of the social realities he's talking about, that we are all in need of conversion. Some, some, more, than some more than others, <laughs> but all of us <laughs> are in need of conversion. Yes. Well, I'm with you in that I feel like he's very welcoming and very approachable. And, um, you know, as far as everyone in this room, we're all capable of being compassionate, but we don't always, we're not always compassionate. We know we are able to do that and should do that. And on a global level, meaning, you know, Earth, our planet that we love, We've all been given the opportunity to recycle, yet we don't do it. Every single one person in this room is able to recycle. You've been given the opportunity that gets picked up, you've been given the bin, you've been, yet you don't do it. Some of you, perhaps. I'm a major advocate. I, I, I take it from my business to my home, I put it on the curb. 
It makes me feel wonderful to have my station wagon filled to the top with the glass that I take to party because they're the only place in the city that takes it. Not to sound trivial, and, and I'm not tooting my own horn, but that is one thing that every person in this room can start That's right. doing if you're not doing it. Other than and always being compassionate and loving and caring for yeah. And there's much more we can do. <coughs> you have to look at his new letter, Laudato Si, which is later in this series. Right, Ted? It's Ted? Yeah. Right? Somebody's going to talk about Laudato, right? In a general way. Okay. So you'll pick that up later in the series. Good. One more. Fred, Karen? Are you worried about a backlash after uh, Francis? Because it seems to me we've had like a 30 year backlash after John. <laughs> Could be. I mean, I sort of wonder what will happen when the next election takes place. There certainly won't be another Jesuit. <laughs> but you could, or it depends on how, how, anyway, I leave that to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, one more. Some is too soon, and some, you know, it's very hard to generalize. I mean, the other thing is, let's, let's take an issue like immigration. I mean, he's clearly speaking out on immigration. Our bishops have been speaking out about it for decades. Um, so in that sense, and, and that's the other thing I would say about Francis. Many of the things Francis is saying have been said by Benedict before him and by John Paul II and by Paul VI, et cetera. I mean, not, there's not a lot of radically new. The, the emphasis on the environment has a great expanded emphasis because he wrote an encyclical about it, but others, popes before him had talked about the environment, but just not in a whole document. So the question is you have to look in different places and different families and different people as to who's hearing what, et cetera, uh, in terms of the various messages he's delivering. And as I say, conversion is, is uh, it's often a slow process and it's something we all need. But uh, it's hard for me to generalize about the whole church in terms of that. They had a big debate at their last meeting about to what extent their priorities uh, on their, the faithful citizenship document, which they always put out one year before the presidential election, to what extent they reflected Francis's priorities or not. And there was a debate among them about that. So. Yes, Ted. When you had uh, said there will never be another, or the next one will not be a judgment, someone yelled out, why not? Why not? Uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I'm not sure many people know this, but just so you understand something about Jesuits, Ignatius hated the fact that any of us would be a bishop. And in fact, when we take our final vows, this most people don't know. We go in the back in the sacristy and we take a set of ancillary promises. One of which is that we will not seek office in the church or in the society of Jesus and we will report anyone who does. <laughs> Every one of us who has final vows takes that promise. Ignatius did not want, he didn't want ambition in the society of Jesus. And I've never actually heard a Jesuit say, I'd like to be provincial or I'd like to be a bishop. I've never heard it. Uh, and so actually Ignatius was death on ambition and he fought against the popes who kept pulling his guys out and making them bishops and cardinals and stuff like that. And we continue to do this and at one point Father Arupe, who was our superior general, said to Pope John Paul II, why don't you consult me before you make my men bishops? And John Paul said, well, what would you say? He said, I'd say we're not supposed to be bishops. And John Paul said, well, I know that. That's why I don't ask you. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. I'm not making these stories up. <laughs> Ignatius just was death. On, and so the most of our guys who got made bishops were bishops in the, in the missions. And then later in the United States, it tended to be guys who might maybe, may have been African-American or Hispanic because the church was looking for, for African-American and Hispanic men to make bishops. And they often took people out of religious orders who'd already been provincials and superiors and stuff like that. But in general, Jesuits think being a bishop is a really bad... In fact, I worked for Bishop Ott in Baton Rouge for five years. I worked for the Bishop's Conference for two and a half years. And I came back and said to my Jesuit brothers, having worked for one bishop for five years and 250 bishops for two and a half years, Ignatius was right. <laughs> We don't want those jobs. But anyway, maybe a Jesuit might be, but 
It took 450 years to get one, so uh, <laughs> I'll turn this back over to Ted. Yeah, uh, Doug? They had a debate at the USDC meeting about to what extent faithful citizenship reflected. Francis's priorities. Did they come out with a conclusion? Uh, um, I wasn't there, so I can't. I just know they had the debate. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We try to get you out in about an hour, and it has been just about an hour, so we thank uh, Father Kammer. Uh, we thank all of you for coming. And again, I would like to remind you that uh, one week from today, Father Jeremy Zippel will be speaking on Living Mercy, the Path of Pope Francis. By the way, one of the questions that came up is, um, could some of the um, traditions of the Jesuits uh, sort of be reflected in Pope Francis? Uh, to put a little plug in, on week five, we're going to have a talk called Pope Francis and Ignatius. And I happen to be the speaker, so I... <laughs> So if you want to know more about what is Jesuit about Pope Francis, please come to the talk. Thank you all for coming.